The sport of off-road racing is full of incredible stories, wild characters, legends, and even villains. We cover it all on offroadracer.com, but there's only so much we can put down in an article. Sometimes we have to dig a little deeper, and that means sitting down with some of our industry's most influential characters and hitting record. Welcome to the Off-Road Racer Podcast, a Mad Media production, made exclusively for offroadracer.com. Each month, we'll go beyond the dirt into the homes, shops, and lives of the most interesting and game-changing icons of our sport. You'll hear about their history, success, failure, and everything in between as we pull back the curtain and reveal the stories of their lives. I'm your host, Matt Martelli, and this is the Off-Road Racer Podcast. I'm Matt Martelli. This is the Off-Road Racer Podcast. I'm here with uh, Ballistic BJ Baldwin, my boy, <laughs> my longtime uh, Thanks, friend. Man. Super stoked to do this. It's been a long time coming. Yeah. Hell yeah. It's nice to see you doing this. This is a cool setup you got going on over here. Well, I, I try to get other people to do it, and, and either they screwed it up or they just weren't getting it done. So I was just like, you know, there's too many things to talk about in off-road not to have more content like this. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. <clears throat> yeah and speak speaking of that you know let's <laughs> we're here to talk about you you know um you know we've known each other for over a decade um and i i know the story but for everybody else like you know everybody sees i think you now and they're like well how how did that happen right <laughs> right how does one just become you know one of the best off-road drivers in the world win the ball 1000 the mid 400 like how did you get into this uh, well, I can't sing and I can't dance and, you know, I could drive a little bit. <laughs> no, uh, originally, you know, going all the way back, it started, uh, I rode in a race with, uh, with JC Dean, like when I was, when I was still in high school, shit, I was 17 years old. Um, and I was always a fan of off-road racing since I was you know, eight or nine years old. I, I just watch, you know, the Baham 1000 and was a big fan of Ivan Stewart, played the Ivan Stewart video games back yeah, in the me day. Too. Yeah, like, like everybody did. Um, and I, I took a strong interest in it, you know, when I was young and, uh, you know, I talked to my, my dad about it and he had a connect with uh, Brendan Gaughan and John Gaughan and, and everybody from what, what is now known as Valley Performance or what is, you know, Pat Dean and, JC Dean we were racing at the time and I got to ride with uh, JC in a class 10 car and it was not what I expected you know I had I had like a, a Chevy Silverado with some Rancho 9000s I was like okay uh, this buggy doesn't really make any power and it's probably as fast as you know, my truck and in, in the bumps because I, you know, I drive a truck and it's got some good, good shocks on it. I was way wrong. And I was really, really, uh, shocked at how well it performed in, in the bumps. And, you know, from the first time I rode in that race car, I was like, you know, I want to try and pursue being exposed or working with, you know, teams or, you know, driving, I, I love this, you know, since, since day one, it's, it's been an awesome journey. Um, and then, uh, I started doing, I started doing, uh, class 10 and then eventually moved into class one and, and trophy truck. But originally it was just kind of a, a family thing that I did with my dad and, you know, low budget race team that evolved into this monstrosity that it is today. <laughs> right. And was yeah. that was that like the nucleus of it though too was like spending time with your dad? Yeah, yeah. In the beginning, it was uh, it, it, in the beginning it was like that, and you know we raced. I I raced before him for several years, but you know he'd come out and support and stuff like that in in class ten and class one. And then eventually, when I was racing class one. Um, Brian Collins was a very famous uh, trophy truck racer back in the days. Yeah, awesome driver. And I was getting my car uh, prepped at his shop at Collins Motorsports. Great guys, Robbie and Billy Gerke. Yeah. And 
they've been with me from the beginning and we were at Laughlin one year and Brian's like, Hey, you know, Bobby, we come do a lap with me for, you know, the pre-run lap. And he was in that three seat, uh, trophy truck that eats all the bumps, you know, I think it's the, the longest wheelbase truck that uh, we've ever seen in the field. I think it was like 132-inch wheelbase or something like that. Everybody right. else is like 125. So that makes it reach from one bump to the next uh, a little bit better. It was really, really good in the rough, really good in the straight lines. And my dad was, uh, my dad was like, yeah, sure, you know, I'll, I'll ride with you. He wasn't really thinking much of it. And he rode with Brian, and Brian's a psychopath. You know? <laughs> he's a psychopath. <laughs> to, to put it lightly. <laughs> to put it lightly. He's, and I love that. That's one of my favorite qualities about him is just like being ruthless as it relates to, ruthlessly confident in going through big terrain, like the moon, moon bumps in, in Lawton. Sure. And uh, he went for a lap, a lap with Brian, and I came back in and I was like, he was just getting out of the truck and he was, I was like, how, how was that? Cause I had already been in it, you know, through testing. And he, he was like, uh, holy shit, we have to get one of these. <laughs> and who like, built that truck? Do you remember? That was, uh, I think that was Billy and Robbie Gerke and yeah. I think Matt Gordon back in the day. Um, but, uh, I was, I was like, do you, do you have any idea what this thing cost? Like, to run, to pull off the trailer, it's right. like $5,000. <laughs> uh, and he was like, I don't care. You know, I'm, I'm doing really well. We have to get one of these. This is the most insane thing. And it is nothing like, you know, what we've been racing for a while. And I was like, well, I, I ain't going to argue with you. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, oh yeah. Okay. Let's go shopping. Yeah. So, um, so starting at, at that moment, uh, they were talking, they were discussing uh, the production of the SPD trucks at the time. They were drawing it out and stuff. And I wanted a, a mid engine truck. I was a very, very big fan of Lair Raglan and, and Robbie Gordon at the time, and uh, amongst other racers. But I really liked that platform of having a mid engine because, and, and I didn't understand things uh, about handling and the dynamics of different chassis layouts and stuff like I do, like I do now, right. not say anything bad about mid engines, but they do have different characteristics that don't align with my driving style currently. Sure. Um, but, uh, I wanted, I wanted to, to build a mid engine truck and they wanted to, there was an argument between all of us. Like they, they were trying to build this front engine monstrosity that I've had a lot of success with in you know, the last 10 years. 15 years um and i was looking at the porter truck that was a uh, damon jeffrey's truck sure and that was available before the completion of the spd truck so that's that's what i began my career in was uh, the old damon jeffrey's trucks nice and so what were the the, the characteristics the characteristic differences between you know a mid-engine and a front engine well, it leaves a lot harder. You know, it leaves a lot harder. A um, little bit more, I don't know if I want to say like mechanical bite or just the weight transfer in it. And it, se it seemed to be a lot lower than the truck I have right now. So that helps with cornering. Rampage is a little tall. You know, sure. I, get, I get smoked in anywhere where there's rutted out corners where you're, you're, able to really drive like it's on rails, like not slide it around. I have, I still have a little, little bit of difficulty with that. It's actually five inches taller at full bump than most everybody else's truck. And, and that design, as I remember, came from Raglan because he liked the visibility, right? Yeah, he loved, he loved the visibility. And it was supposed to be a well-rounded truck that does you know just about everything really well. And it corners really well. It's, it's uh, I think Raglan had a lot of input on it. It's similar to something in the steering geometry, you know, that I, I don't know anything about that his truck was really good at that they applied some of those uh, characteristics to Rampage. But they, they did a great job. Obviously, the, the truck is 
very old and i've had a lot of success and won a lot of championships in it yeah and it's it's interesting because those trucks are very unique in in the field of trucks right mm -hmm. and uh you know you you can pick them out design wise and go okay you know that's that's one of the the spd trucks and, and that, that was you know was those trucks were designed by savage right yeah savage uh and dave peralt okay so and you know dave I don't remember how many trucks he built, him him and Savage built, but I don't think there's too many of them. Not out a lot. There. There's, I think there's only three, you know, in circulation that currently race anymore. Yeah, which is weird because they, you know, again, it's like monkey see, monkey do. It's like we were talking about this on another podcast of like, you know, the Geysers built a very, you know, stable, unbreakable, or li I'd say reliable, nothing's unbreakable, right? Yeah. Uh, platform and they sold a ton of those trucks. So there's a ton of those trucks out there, and they want a ton of stuff. Probably, honestly, the most winning is platform. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Due to the combination of its, you know, how well the trucks or how easy they were to drive, and you know how well they stay together, right? Um, but then you start doing race car stuff, and you're, hey, if we sacrifice this, we can go a little bit faster, or we can corner better if we lighten the truck and. That's what I love about off-road racing is it's a constant, right? Like everybody's like, oh no, it's settled. It's, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, Mason truck. And I'm like, yeah, well, it used to be a geyser truck and now it's a Mason truck. And now, you know, I was, I don't know, I don't know if it's public knowledge or not, but I was down in, in Baja listening to Mason and Jesse Jones talk about, you know, a plunged axle trophy truck. And I'm like, here we go, right? You know, here's here's another push the envelope. Which another I, evolution. Yeah, yeah, which I think is cool, you know, because now. That's the first I'm hearing for it. That sounds Yeah, it, it sounds really, I mean, it's a UTV, right? Like, if you could get that, you know, those that platform to work, it, it would be superior in a lot of ways. Like, maybe not in the bumps. I don't know. Like, what do you think about that? <sighs> Plunged to axle, are we talking about? Four wheel drive, yeah. Four wheel and drive. I'd have to look and see how that layout would be. Um, I I've driven uh, Bryce's old four wheel drive, the Huseman four wheel drive before, yeah. and that was years ago when they were first coming out. I'll I'll never f forget. I pissed a lot of guys off on their team for for a minute, but uh, I was out there testing, and and Bryce was there. And I just got done, and he's you know wrapping up testing. I was like, I was like, where where are the keys to this this thing? Can I have you know can I take it for a spin? He's like, yeah, just don't put any more than I think forty four miles on it. And I was like, Jesus, I'm I just want to do my loop. It's thirteen point three miles, right? And so he's uh, he's like, yeah, go ahead. So I took it out and came back. I uh, I had a pretty good understanding very quickly of of what it does well and what it doesn't so i came back and all of their pit guys came over like all their team guys a lot of them i knew very well and they were all interested in what i had to say sure. you know so that, so that they can learn from a different uh, perspective and i i knew that they were you know they were crowding around as soon as i pulled in to listen right and I put the window net down. I took my helmet off. They're like, what, you know, what do you think? You know, they want like, <laughs> like a pat on the back. Like, yeah. wow, this is the most amazing thing. And I said, I, let's take a moment. And um, I want you guys to guess what I'm going to say. And one guy goes, oh, it's so much more corner speed because you don't realize how fast you're going. Another guy was like, I uh, can't believe how well it accelerates. And, you know, they had a couple other guesses. Sure. And I was like, no, 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 no. I think there was like 12 guys around the truck at the time. Like, no, that's not it. And they're like, okay, well, what, what is that? I said, I have one word. And they're like, okay, it's disappointing. And they didn't like, half of them were like, fuck this guy. And they, sure. and they, and they walked off. And the other half came in because they were interested in what I had to say. And they said, okay, uh, why, why is it disappointing? I was like, well, you're making all this traction. Why do you have this motor in there? I mean, if, if you could, it, it's not really a big block. 
like right. a, a 530 inch motor right in my mind as i define it that's not really a big block that's like saying i have a small block and it's, sure. a, it's a 289 right um and so you're making all this traction why aren't you putting a bigger motor in this thing it makes a thousand horsepower that's not very much, right? You know, especially adding the weight, right? I think it only made like nine hundred fifty or something like that. Yeah, the weight's more because it's like probably what a thousand pounds heavier than a two wheel drive. I I don't know exactly the weight, but uh, yeah, I was like, if you're making all this traction, why aren't you making significantly more power? Because sure. two wheel drives, we we don't get uh, we don't get grip on a normal surface until we're going about 80 miles an hour. Right. And this thing gets grip immediately. You might yeah. as well take advantage of, of that quality of, of the platform and put a bigger motor in. Like I've always said, if I can get the powertrain to live, if I can get the tire wear, you know, like I want it and the reliability and everything else, I would put, I would have a four wheel drive with three or 4,000 horsepower in it. You know, right. that would be great. Yeah. That would be great. Just like, Think of it like uh, electric go-karts. You know, everybody's that can drive a little bit, you know, they're all like battling when you go to the go-kart place with your family and whatnot. Sure. Well, if you add a bunch of power to those go-karts, now you're separating the field, like the, separating the men from the boys because they're way more difficult to deal with when you have substantially more acceleration than sure. you did with some electric go-karts. So that's... That's what I thought about uh, that specific platform. Would, would I love to have one one day? Yeah, I have one that's half built. I got to you know get the funding to finish the rest of it. But the motor that when I had funding to to do my four wheel drive, uh, I talked to Peralt. Dave Peralt was building it, right? And we had talked about it for a couple of years, and he said, "Okay, we got most of this dialed. Like, what you know? What do you want?" I says, "I want inches." And he's like, "Oh my god!" Like. What are you talking about? I said, I want inches in the cab so my uh, legs are outside 90 degrees and I have the most power for braking. And I want inches uh, for my height because I'm not really built for race cars. I'm kind of a tall guy. <laughs> and I want inches in the engine bay. He's like, oh, my God. Uh, how, how big do you want to go? I said, I want 700 inches and I want room for twin turbo chargers in the future. When it comes to that, I want it yeah. to be able to evolve into something that can make 2,000 horsepower. Because I think that would really make things a lot more interesting, you know. 100%. I mean, it's interesting because when you talk about the horsepower to weight ratio, a lot of people don't understand how heavy these trucks are, right? And so, you know, when people, people ask me about off-road racing, they're like, well, what makes it remarkable? It's, it's a suspension, right? Yeah. But to your point, there are engine solutions out there for us that can increase our horsepower. We just haven't needed them yet because we couldn't apply that horsepower to the ground with a two-wheel drive truck. Right? Yeah. So that that's pretty interesting, you know? And, it, and it's, you know, I, I was really fascinated by that truck build because, you know, I'm friends with the Huseman's and they built arguably the best pro four in the field when Rick, oh, yeah. Rick was still alive. Dominating, yeah. And yeah, he absolutely dominated, you know, but then, you know, what's funny is, and I, again, be curious about your opinion about this, but then this fucking kid from Pahrump shows up and, you know, he's nobody. Robbie. And, yeah. He builds, he builds a truck and I love he him. does some damage and like beats, you know, wins some races, you know, on a shoestring budget. But then he starts designing trucks, and then he designs a Pro 4 that, you know, in turn, Kyle Duke raced and dominated. You know, and it's it's that's one of the things that I love about this culture is, like, the idea still exists in this culture that, like, oh, you, you want to build a spaceship? We could do it in our garage, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. how everybody thinks, right? We have one page yeah. for our rule book. It's not like NASCAR. We, they bring out, you know, like a gigantic book of rules. Yeah. I, I remember driving, uh, I got a chance to drive Robbie Gordon's, uh, what was it, uh, Watkins Glen car. I, I, I drove okay. his stock car years ago. Um, and that was very wild. That was very wild. That was super cool. Thing revs to 10,000 RPM or whatever it was. But he was pointing out, like, this is, you know, stock car racing. You see this bolt on the spindle. He's like, this this bolt has to be here from, like, 
a rule in 1956 or something like right. that. It does nothing. Yeah. It's just got th- threading on the spindle and it <laughs> bolts there and it's like fastens her and that's it. it. It's really, it's weird. You know, it's weird to look at them basically racing Monte Carlo still yeah. to this day. <laughs> yeah. Right. And they're like, we don't understand why people aren't tuning in for this. And I'm like, yeah. you know what I mean? It's boring, you know? Yeah. Unfortunately. Wasn't but, born to drive that thing. Oh, my God. Yeah, they're a handful. Yeah. Racing against your dad is something that 90% of the racers in the world will never get. I've accomplished everything I wanted to do, and now he's just, like, taking the reins. I want to be remembered for being a, a, a huge part of short course, not just racing, keeping it alive, helping it grow. If it comes down to the last weekend and I'm in it, and boys better watch out. <laughs> but, you know, I want to go back to, like, cool, so you get your, your history, like, because I think a lot of people are very interested in how you got to where you got to, right? Mm-hmm. And so, like, you know, we, we left off with, cool, you get handed an SPD truck, and, you know, everybody that you're racing at that time was you know really more funded than you they were older than you they had more experience than you you know what talk about that evolution going from like you know how old were you when you when you got when you started racing trophy trucks you're in your early 20s right yeah i was 23 years old um and i led it's like hey (laughs) hey 23 year old kid here's an f-16 good luck yeah exactly it's not gonna go well (laughs) exactly No, we could talk about the evolution of my driving and the evolution of uh, the business part of it. But as as it relates to to the driving, um, I I was I had some skill. It was it was different, you know, from uh, from racing buggies. Um, and this is it's like skiing and snowboarding. Like just because you're a really good skier doesn't mean you could just hop on a snowboard and get it done. They, they have completely inverted characteristics between a buggy and a truck. Right. You know, um, but yeah, in 2003, my first race was Prem. Uh, ended up getting like sixth place or something. I think we had some transmission problems that race. But after that, we went to the Baja 1000. It was my first uh, trophy truck race in a Baja 1000. And I ended up leading that race for like six hours. Um, and then we had some problems. Larry Joe drove the second half and he, he had some trouble. He blew a corner and got stuck for a little bit, got a flat and we ended up finishing fifth. Um, Adam Wick was navigating for him and going through San Felipe, you know, it's late at night. So everybody's partying, having a good time yeah. down there. And they had, and, and they've been partying for usually a yeah, day since before like, that. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, there's, and they start drinking again at 11 o'clock in, in the morning. <laughs> Fall down, pick up a bottle. It's great. But people who haven't experienced it, it is wild. It's really wild. It is really wild. It's, it's awesome. But they had, uh, back to uh, uh, Adam, when they were going, when they took my truck, they got stuck, they got a flat, they got going again, and they were going through the bumps in San Felipe, and they had like a big crowd of spectators that were all drinking. Somebody lobbed a, a rock into the truck and it skipped off the hood of, of my truck into the navigator seat, broke the helmet and broke Adam Wick's jaw. And like, I don't know if it knocked one of his two teeth out, but he, he got really, really messed up and they had to take him to the hospital. But we ended up getting fifth and he, he got stitched up in Mexico. I think he got like... 18 stitches or something like that. And jaw was got fixed when he got back to the States. But, uh, yeah, I, my drive, my evolution through, you know, my skill set at that time to, you know, my skill set in, in 2006, three, three years later, it all came from having the opportunity to, to ride and, uh, and drive with Larry Raglan. You know, he was, one of my heroes growing up and I got the opportunity to ride with him and, and pre-run with him in 2003. Um, Brian Collins, which eventually evolved into him and I pre-running for five or six years down in Baja. But Brian Collins um, got it set up. He's, he's like, hey, I'm, I'm going to 
but you go through the crossover road. Larry has to uh, do this section again. It's like a seventh time through this section, so he knows it really well. And then you can see, you know, how we do things in, in trucks and so. So I was like super excited. It's like this is awesome. You know, I met Larry like a, a, a couple times. It was before we were like super tight. This was in two thousand three. Right. And you know, I, I I remember talking about this last night. I was just telling the story, but. Larry was like, when, once we got there, he's in the two seat old, uh, Collins pre-runner. It was short, so very, very nimble, but had, didn't have a big motor like we have in our pre-runners now. I think it made like 500 horsepower, but it's very, very nimble truck. Very short. It's 125 for a pre-runner. That's pretty short. And I remember him like messing, you know, with some stuff. I don't remember. It was like some GPS or something like that. And we were going down a dirt road to, to intercept the course to begin the pre-run. And we went over a, a jump, like clear over. He knew it so well. It was like a clear over rise. And we went sailing. And he was pr going pretty far in the air and pretty long distance. But it wasn't like, you know, if I hit a jump, I'm like this. He knew it so well. He was still messing with stuff. And we were sailing like a, 150 feet. Like it was... <laughs> Like not yeah. not an issue or something. Like, it was seventy five from <clears throat> seventy five miles an hour from this corner to this corner, regardless of what was in between. Right. He was just in transport to to begin pre running. And then uh, he says, "You know, all right, BJ, this is kind of how we do it." And there was a steak bed um, full of some locals in there, and they were cheering and stuff like that. And it was a left hand turn and he leaned on it super hard and I'm like looking at this, like this thing is going off of this cliff, you know, it's like big cliff right here, steak beds right here. And I'm like, I hope, I hope we made this. I was, I was a little intimidated by what right. was going on. It was just the first moment of me being able to see what, what this thing was capable of. And he's pointed the thing that way. And I'm like, dude, it's, it's a wrap. It, we're done. Right. I was really, really scared. And then he rotated it this way to you know change change the angle of the approach into the corner and get the uh ditch hook on this side and kind of put on a show for for the locals that were there and then he drove that section like the thing was staple to the road you know and i got to see a lot of uh what he was doing and then we went on to become very close and i pre-ran with them for uh a lot of miles and I drove most of the time and it went from him, you know, saying, you know, if you don't calm down, I'm going to take the keys from you <laughs> to, it went from I that. I think I've said that to you. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it went from, uh, you know, if you don't chill out, I'm going to take the keys from you to don't you dare lift, you know, right. from, from him being really uncomfortable with me to me being really uncomfortable with him telling me not to lift, like I'm doing exactly what this legend is, is telling me to develop my skill set. And yeah. this is like in the trees, sideways, third gear on the chip, or yeah. second gear on the chip at 85 miles an hour. And I'm like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing what you say. And he, he helped me a lot, you know. He helped me a, a whole it, bunch. He's a really interesting character in our culture because, you know, like a lot of guys, they don't really self-promote. Right. Yeah. But when, you know, we were talking about it earlier, like he's still racing, you know? Yeah. And, um, and he's good, you know, it's not like he's way off the pace. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, one of the things that, that is to me very interesting about him is the story in which he told me about how he developed his style, which was, you know, racing Pike's peak. And he got introduced to, you know, basically watching Ari Vatanen. Yeah. Uh, attack Pike's Peak, you know, and Ari went on to produce a very famous film called Climb Dance, and yeah, and that that <clears throat> that film is very is excellent. You it's know. it's like the first motorsports viral video, isn't it? I I would I would say so. I mean, right. like that had a huge influence on me and my brother uh, and Ken Block when we did Jim Con. I mean, I was like, we we want to do that. Yeah. Right. And especially I find it that film especially impressive because they had to do it with film. You know, there are no GoPros, yeah. right? Like all that stuff <laughs> is like, oh, we're gonna hang a big ass camera, yeah, shoot film and then process it and hope we got plus audio gear, because the audio on it is 
unbelievable. Yeah, it's gnarly. But point being is like, you know, you're talking about uh, the cornering that rally cars do, Scandinavian flicks, some people call it. And um, that was him seeing Ari do it on Pike's Peak and realize like, holy shit, this guy's getting around way quicker than everybody else because of this technique. Yes. Right? And then bringing that to off-road. And, well, there may have been some people doing it. I find that that particular point, and him in particular, I think it's very interesting because it's this connection between rally and off-road, which which later on we'll, we'll get to. But, like, you, you you picked up more and more of those uh, those skills and disciplines, and and you know, I tell people a lot of a, a lot uh, this a lot in that you know going to rally school a lot of times is not going to teach you new things. Yeah, but it's going to teach you what they're called and why you should be doing them right and yes. when it's appropriate to use that that technique and and so on and so forth. So, anyways, but please continue. So no that 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 rally school that you had me go to like years ago that was. I already knew all that stuff because I had already been pre-running with Larry, but it right. helped me understand it a little bit better. I did pick up a trail trail breaking technique that that works has worked very well, but it puts it together as it relates to how to do certain things, when to apply them, and when it's uh, parasitic to apply certain methods. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's you know I describe these things to people that don't know. I said it's a million dollar piece of equipment with you know, $130,000 motor, it makes 1,100 horsepower. And they're like, wow, the thing, you know, must be really fast in the dirt. I was like, no, it's not. It does not accelerate well at all. It does not slow down very well, and it doesn't like to change direction. Right. And they're thinking like, that. that's what makes it special. Yeah. Every other race car in the world does those three things very, very well. And it makes it easy, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and two, that's the other thing. And I, I get, you know, I get super annoyed when I'm watching F1 or whatever. And they're talking about the track changes. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm like, Oh really? The track <laughs> changes. We have boulders. <laughs> like you're talking about, we have people throwing rocks at us. You know yeah. what I mean? It, it's, it's so crazy when you extrapolate out the amount of variables. And again, that's why I have a very high appreciation for, for you, your Thank driving you. style, and then also the the lineage through Ragland, because I think that was one that one of the things that was lacking in our sport was discipline, right? Mm-hmm. Like, all right, bitch, and we got all the horsepower, we got all the you know, and you you watch these guys drive, and you're like, what are you doing? You're like literally <laughs> blowing every corner, right? Yeah, and then so they get funny. out, and they're like, man, it was crazy race. I'm like, yes, because you blew every corner, right? <laughs> you got 20 flats because you're hitting everything. Yeah, right? I, I remember talking to Larry, and I'm like, Larry, so you know, what do you do when you see these rocks in in these areas? He goes, J- I don't hit them. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I go, well, do you slow down or go around them? He goes, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm, I'm I'm expecting him to give me some crazy Jedi stuff. and No, he just tiptoes through that yeah, stuff. Yeah. And, like, you know, it's just discipline. It's, like, nowhere to be fast, nowhere to be slow. You know, and then you're like, okay, I got to push because I'm second or whatever the situation is. Then you have to, you know, drive over the line, and that's where, you know, shit can go wrong, right? Yeah, that's, that's what he taught. He taught me a lot about... You know when to stretch the rubber band thin, and and I spending a lot of time with him. I had a really good understanding with uh, you know normal operation where you're comfortable. You have you know standard uh, heart rate, respiration rate, blood pressure, and stuff like that. And then like when you got like somebody like Bryce Menzies chasing me down, or who, who's a savage. He's he's a killer, or Rob McCachran, or one of those guys that's really really good. Then you have to say, okay, I'm going to do things I know I can do that have uh, exceptional risk and drive at 108% of my capacity. When normal operation is like, you know, 95, 97, 98. Right. Um, So I'm going to do things that I know are probably going to work out, you know, Um, but something bad may happen but in certain circumstances you have to take a uh, calculated risk and drive just a little bit outside of your your comfort zone outside of your skill set and ability to manufacture time for that fuel pit to, to you know to make those 
few seconds so that you can beat somebody on correct at time. And going from, you know, tiptoeing through rocks, taking deep breaths, you know, going up the summit or something like that, to, all right, we got to burn it down through the beach to make the time for the, the last fuel yeah. pit. You know, and having, being cognizant in those decisions and not racing, you know, with the white knuckles and leaving your fingerprints on the steering wheel and the shifter. Um, that's very, very important to have a successful career and a, su a successful race to, to be able to put yourself in those different modes. Like you're, you have to have, um, you have to be very, very precise, know where you're at, know what risks you can take. And then if you have to go into murder mode and you know, you're ready to cut the guy's throat in front of you, you have to be able to access that and mitigate whatever risk is associated with taking yourself to that level as it relates to driving. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's very interesting again, because you know, there's, there's skill, right? There's equipment, but then the psychology part of it, especially in our sport to me is really fascinating because, and, and I want to get into, you know, one of your biggest victories uh, was you winning. It was 12 when you won the 2012, when you won the ball 1000. Yeah. The first one I won is 2012. I won it, I won it again in, in 2013. I've had a handful of podiums up there, but yeah, those were my two really good years that I hope to duplicate well, in the future. <laughs> so what, what, you know, and so you iron man those, right. Mm -hmm. And so what, you know, that was a bad business decision, <laughs> right? But it clearly worked out because I yeah. remember talking to you about it. And I'm like, no, no, no. Drive 600 miles, switch somebody out. Yeah. You know what I mean? And like, what? Why did you decide to to take that on? Take because it was a huge risk. You're 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 battling teams that you know. Cool. You get to that 600 mile ish mark, and they're putting in a fresh driver. Yeah. Right. And and you got to. So it's not just you against nature and equipment and everything else. Like they just put in a fresh driver, right? So he hasn't been in the car now for, you know, what would that be? Like 14 hours, right? Yeah. And, and I've been, you know, in the paint shaker going through San Felipe and I'm all beat up and I'm, you know, my thighs are bleeding and my shoulder blades and the belts, you know, and I'm obviously very, very tired and I can see ghosts and everything in between. Yeah. Um, no, for, for me, there's a couple of reasons why I, uh, I did those and I, I've done, um, I think of Iron Man like five of them or something like that. And some of them were, uns you know, obviously most of them were unsuccessful. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's know? my point. Right? It's, uh, it's, it's very <clears throat> difficult. But if you're just trying to win, uh, you know, two, three drivers, it's, it maximizes your, uh, tactical advantage in, in that you only have to worry about a certain section. So you right. don't even care what's over there. Right. So in pre-running, that's one thing that nobody even thinks about. Like you're, you're only pre-running a, a 400 mile race. Right. So you got to get to, and it's easier to, it's so much easier to do that. Like if I'm down, if it's a peninsula run and I'm pre-running for nine days or 10 days, I only get to see the course twice because of all the highway driving that's yeah. involved in it. And I'll circle back around and see certain things. But yeah, to answer your question, I, I did that because I wanted to stretch myself that far as it relates to uh, being able, to, being able to, to do it is extremely difficult. It's not like going 1,000 miles. You know, like 500 miles is one thing. But the next hundred miles feels like the first five hundred. Yeah, and it's it gets exponentially worse. So like the last twenty miles is is longer you're than dying. The, it's longer than the first eleven hundred. No, you're. I mean, yeah. people don't. I, I don't think they have a grasp of like, okay, cool. Like uh, it's like driving across America, right? Yeah, that's easy. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean compared to what you're doing, even though it's longer, right? Yeah, but it's but it's you know, the amount of input that your body is taking in physically and mentally. The, the other thing to me, like the mental strain, I, I don't think people understand because this is an open track. So you mm -hmm. have shit coming at you. Uh, you. You're worried about traffic, what the Farm other guys. trucks. Yeah. You know. Communications, especially then, yeah. were shitty. So oh, it was yeah. like, what did he say? I don't. Did, did he say somebody's in front of me? You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? Like, what was the time split? You know, and all this stuff is, is going through your head, and it's really, really mental. 
Like, yeah. like, you know, I have never done a thousand miles, but I've done, you know, multi hundred mile stints. And like, you know, I get to the end of it and I'm like, I, I could have cut that in half. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, like you, and then, and then, and it, I'm sure you go through this is you smoke yourself, right? You smoke yourself and then you recoup and then you're like, that was badass. Oh yeah. And you want to do it again. Oh yeah. You're, you're an inch away from, you know, death. You feel like when you get out of the car and, and after you've been out for four hours, you feel so much better. Like you, you don't really, you, you can't really grasp after a very long event like that. Like how, especially it's one thing to iron man it. It's another thing to iron man it with the intention to win. Sure. And being in the field of being in the mix with S- savages. You right. Know? They're, yeah. And, it's different than and just they're, trying to finish. You know? And they're adding fresh guys. They're like, okay, well, I just raced you for half the peninsula. Now I'm putting in a fresh guy. Fuck yeah. you. you it's know what it's mean? Like, round robin. Yeah. You know, for, for like the, the it, fight game, it's like, you know, you're sparring one guy and then yeah. some other guy comes exactly. in. Like that's, that. fresh, yeah, right? that's fresh. It's crazy. Yeah. You know, it, so when you did that, how many hours were you in the car? 26 hours? No, not that long. I was uh, I was in there for twenty hours and fifteen minutes. I think it was twenty hours, fourteen minutes and fifty nine seconds. Almost twenty fifteen. Yeah. So, Mitch, why is this bike so drippy? It's our twenty three race bike. We can start up front, work our way to the back. Bones can tell you about the suspension. The rear shock is one of the most critical parts of the bike. Pegs with the titanium mounts. Kashima coating here. Anti gravity lightweight battery. Young's modulus. Horse and a half. Works, Works chassis lab. More tie than a space shuttle. Really? I might need that repeated. This thing slaps. Slaps. Oh, you should have told me that earlier. And yeah, that was uh, the the peninsula run was uh, very difficult. But I was, you know, we we got out front early. Yeah, and uh, and then actually, I think mile five hundred, we we were uh, you know learning. We 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 didn't have comms for a, a large part, so I was really trying to like just stay out front. And being out front, you know, in the first. 300 miles right it's not fantastic right. because you know you you're all by yourself out there and you you don't have there's no blood in the water right you know so you don't have anything to anybody to chase down it's it's not as nearly as motivating as as being like third or, or fourth car and right. you, you have you know a goal you get comms on where everybody's at time splits really accurate time splits on where everybody's at when you're first on the road you don't get that right. kind of stuff so um that's another challenge in itself yeah is it fun to be first car on the road at the baja 1000 hell yeah hell yeah it's fun you know you're the first person that everybody sees and they've been there for nine hours you know uh drinking casamigos waiting for the first car so they can cheer them on and you know yeah so that's that's really awesome uh, but uh, yeah, it's it, it's not something that can be described in words in terms of having a competitive run and being, you know, at war with all these high level guys uh, right. for a lot. It's a lot more work than they had to go through. Sure. So, but you know, f- from my standpoint, I wanted to do it because when I was a kid, I was a very big fan of Ivan Stewart. You know, he's a great guy. He's awesome. So I wanted to do that you know, uh, what he was doing. And it's cool to have, no, nobody ever talks about this and it kind of gets swept under the rug, but I, I think I get a pass to talk about this so I can talk a little bit of trash. But at the time I was like, well, you know, you didn't really win the ball 1000. You know, that I was, I was kind of uh, enjoying the fact that I was directly responsible for all of the driving, not just half of it. Sure. So that was a, that was a very big yeah, and thing. Yeah, I, I don't me. think... I don't think anybody's Iron Man didn't want it since, right? No. Mm. Which is, that's pretty punk rock. Right? Yeah, it's super punk rock. You know I don't I mean? think anybody's going to do it again. The course is different than, yeah, it's, you know, it was when, when Ivan was running it. No shade on Ivan. He's a fucking legend, but yeah, um, it's a lot rougher. Yeah. A lot more uh, brutal, you know, so there's the attention standpoint that's, you know, speaks for itself. Let's drive well, as the, fast I as think we can the, for 20 hours. <laughs> yeah, and, but I think also the competition, too, and the equipment, you know, everything has increased, increased, increased. Yeah. And, and, and gotten tighter, so it, it would be rad to see it, you mm-hmm. know? But, like, 
you know, it, it's just, it takes the right person to make the, the physical, mental, you know, uh, you know, like the total commitment, you know, yeah. it's, it's funny because I started thinking about it a lot uh, because Tour de France is going on right now. Right. Mm. And, and I'm a, I'm a fan, right. Of that event. Cause it's just pure savagery. It's like, you know, he, you win a stage and you're like, yeah, I won a stage. I got to go get on a stationary bike. So my legs don't freeze up, so I can oh, yeah. so I can get back on a bike tomorrow. Yeah, right. So you can't even party, like you know what I mean. You're, <laughs> yeah. you're like, yay! I don't like you know. So uh, that's just a savage or, or a beautiful example of human savagery of what you can do, and and that's what I appreciate about you know you doing that, and then and then backing it up and doing it again because that like you know unfortunately you know in this mar- in this market everybody's like well so and so broke and it's yeah. the you know it's the weather and it was all this <laughs> yeah. stuff and I'm like I didn't have my shoelaces I'm, tied and right and usually yeah. the the people that are saying that like they haven't done shit in their life no. you know what I mean they can't pull out of the garage without <clears throat> hitting the fucking house right so <laughs> so I mean what was that like for you I mean like before that you had won races right mm-hmm. and and they you know they were significant races but you do that and like what what was that like for you you come back and you're like I'm fucking Superman or what? Like, what was that like for you? I felt pretty good. Cause you, you know, it's one thing to, you know, win championships and win races and stuff like that. But when you win the ball in a thousand, you're just burned in, in the history books. Yeah. Like forever, yep. you know, cause that is the pinnacle of, uh, of any brutal motorsport event yeah. on the planet. Yeah. It's winning the ball in a thousand, yeah. you know, hundred percent agree. Um, it, it was, it was awesome. And what's nice is that never goes away. No, like you, you never forget that, and neither does anybody else. You know, I, it, it was a a great battle. Specifically, twenty thirteen was an awesome battle. I had a really good battle with Bryce in uh, two thousand twelve in the Peninsula Run, um, and that was on my way to to get to be first car on the road. And then in two thousand thirteen, you know, I had a gnarly battle with Andy McMillan, who's a savage. Everybody knows him. Yeah. And then Andy got out of the truck, went to go have some sandwiches and put Rob McCachern in. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I had to battle with Rob McCachern. Him and I were, uh, it was like not raining like torrential downpour. It was like misting. So yeah. there was no dust. You know, we always battle with dust and desert racing. And, uh, you know, we were, within three car lengths of each other for like 130 miles all the way to the finish. Right. And that was epic because he's, you know, he's he's one of the goats. He's he, awesome. He is the goat. I mean, and that's, that's what's rad too. Again, like, you know, uh, what I appreciate about you is that, you know, you're not ducking, you know, you're not ducking fights, right? Yeah. You're like, okay, I'm going to, it's going to be hard. I'm going to, I want it hard. I want to go against the best. I want to beat the best. You know, I want to come out bleeding. You know what I mean? A hundred percent. It's like, you know, we we're here in Vegas and, and we went to the, the, the hall of fame last night. And one of the inductees was, uh, uh, Robbie Lawler for his fight with Rory McDonald, which I was at. Right. Yeah. Like I was, I was like teared up after that fight, right? Like I I felt so appreciative that I was there to witness two of the highest level human beings try and kill each other. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and it's defining. Right. And you know. and that's that's the way I feel about off-road racing. That's part of the reason why I love it so much is is it's the truth. Right? Yeah. You can talk all the shit you want. You know what I mean? But at the end of the day, the Mojave Desert, the the deserts of Baja, you know, the competition you know, equipment, it's going to get decided. I don't decide. I'm just putting on the fist fight, right? Yeah. You know, and I'm going to try and put on the best fist fight in the world because I want to, con- you know, just as a fan, I want to see that human spectacle of like, you know, this thing that we get to do where, you know, you come away from it and you're like, okay, I just unlocked some shit in my DNA that yeah. I didn't know existed, right? And then other mm-hmm. people look at it and they're like, all right. That's possible. Maybe, you know, I'll give that a shot, right? Yeah. And it just does this it's this energy that just goes out that, you know, proliferates the the whole thing. And I, in this day and age, I think it's super important, right? Yeah, uh, just because of the way, you know, uh, you know, culture has been treated 
and these things aren't held in high value like they used to be. Yeah. So it's I, I think it's bad. It's ass. rough. I, I think we'll I think we'll get past that and we'll get to yeah. a good point again. But yeah, you, you, you taking you know the last uh, handful of years, you putting on races and stuff like that. I'm really excited to see that because you're really really passionate about it, and you put on a great event. There's media's the the media surrounding the events is is awesome. We capitalize on it and share that stuff. So you know I'm I'm really excited to to pick and choose and, and race some of your races in the future. It's awesome. I love the, the men. You've done a killer job with the men. No, I appreciate you know? that. I, I mean, the- to be honest, like me and my brother, like we're, we're just, and my cousin, I got to talk about him because he, he's putting in a lot of effort over the years um, and continues to, but like, we're just, honestly, we're getting started. We, we had this idea like, Hey, cool. We'll do this one event and, <clears throat> and everybody will see what we're doing. They'll copy it. It'll, the whole thing will grow. That didn't really happen. So it's just like anything else where I'm like, okay, I guess we need to do it. Right? Yeah. And I, I really hold this culture in high regard. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, I grew up in it, you know, and I grew up around these people and, and both on like the mechanical side, I think that part's really special. The, you know, the, the Masons, the savages, the guys, yeah, the one page rule book. <laughs> yeah. But, but these guys, you know, it's the spear. I was, I was explaining it. As like, you know, stuff I saw Mickey Thompson do, like, what makes you think that you can draw a car on your garage floor or and, a napkin and, and then go set the world speed record? That's yeah. what Mickey, Mickey oh, was. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a, um, a printing press operator before that. Yeah. And he's like, well, I think if we put two, I think it was Cadillac engines in line, I think we can beat the, all the factories from Europe. And he went and did that, right? Yeah. So that spirit of like... You, you know, everything is possible and we're Americans, so we can definitely do it. Right. Mm-hmm. That's still here in off-road racing and same thing with the drivers. Right. It's like when you distill down what we're doing, this is hard. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like, you're going to ruin your, you're going to ruin your finances. <laughs> you know, you're going to ruin yourself physically and mentally, and you're going to ruin a lot of relationships because most people operate in this kind of like friendly space of like, Oh, you flaked on me. No big deal. But when you need people to be there for you in an off-road race, you find out very quickly who's reliable. Oh, yeah. Right? When you're like, hey, uh, Bob, I need you to take my $100,000 uh, worth of equipment, uh, drive it you know, 14 hours down the peninsula, not get hit by all the oncoming Mexican <laughs> yeah, you the know, traffic's wild with, down there with no lights and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, and, and do it for free, by the way, right? Because you, you you love me and you love the the adventure of it, right? Mm. So that's yeah. why I name everything. That's why I name all the trucks, I, and I love that. I, I I think they are deserving. Well, two different reasons because it speeds up communication when you say, "Hey, Fedor needs a power steering pump. Rampage needs a you know an yeah. input shaft or whatever." It, I I also like the main reason why I name the trucks because I think there's spirit behind them and there's so much love uh, and passion and obsession in this sport, which is what makes the community so I great. Agree. The community is first class. They're awesome. They're always willing to help, help each other. Uh, I remember Robbie Gordon, I think was leading the 500 and, uh, he had to go get fuel cause his guys weren't there. He had to go get fuel from the herbs. They stabbed him, uh, full of fuel. I think he ended up winning that race years ago, a half dozen years ago. Right. But the community's so great because of the passion that's involved yeah. in this sport i i 100 agree with you on naming stuff it drives me crazy yeah like i ask people hey what's the name of your truck and they're like oh it's i don't know it's a truck and i'm like come <laughs> on you know like actually really funny story so we do these shirts for dirtco and they're celebrations of specific vehicles so we've done one with the truggy uh we're gonna do the the black diamond truck um, and I was, I called Tommy Morris. I'm like, Hey, what did you, was, what was the name for Ivan's truck? And he goes, the PPI truck. And I go, yeah, well, that, that was like this iconic truck that was important to like, you just said all yeah. of us, right? Very inspiring. You know? And he's like, Oh, we just called that one. Oh, one. And I'm like, <laughs> in my head, I'm like, I should just name it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I should just name it and something funny that would piss off the old guys like bad motherfucker whatever <laughs> you like i'm sure it wouldn't you know be well received but like i i think that that's you know that's important because it also gives people a way to identify it like i yes. i hear people 
you know, in the pits going, oh, here comes BJ and Fedor, right? Yeah. You know, and I'm like, that's badass, right? Yeah. And they they probably don't even know who Fedor Emelianenko is, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. But it's okay, you know? <laughs> but, yeah, so, you know, after the 1,000, um, you know, <clears throat> you continue to have success. You had a lot of challenges as well, right? Like equipment yeah. changes, staff changes. I mean, you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, uh, Johnny Nelson was my navigator at, at the time, and he was the lead tech on on prepping Rampage. Great guy, had a great relationship with him, but he got uh, opportunity to work with another team. So he broke up with me right after that 2013 Fall 1000. I'm sure he'd had enough, right? <laughs> yeah, he had enough. Well, I, I, my <laughs> m- best memory of him was when we were in Germany and all of his clothes got, like, they lost oh his God, bag, Oh, my that's right? right, yeah. So, and then we remember we were unpacking the truck from the, um, from the uh, sea container and we had covered it with all that grease. Yeah, with trans fluid. Yeah. yeah. So then it was like, for, that was the first thing is like, that was the start of me hating trans fluid. <laughs> yeah. The smell of it and everything is, is helping him clean the truck up. So he's covered in trans fluid and he's, he goes back and they were long days. We were, we were doing like, you know, 18 hour days or whatever. And we go back to the hotel and, and, and he's, he has no clothes. So he, Washed his pants and his t-shirt every day. <laughs> yeah, hung it out to dry. Got up, put it back on. It didn't complain at all. No, nothing. You know, no, nothing. And we we were having a good time through. He he had a great time through all that. Yeah, yeah. John Johnny's a, a savage. I, I I love that guy. He's uh, yeah. So he had he had an opportunity to uh, you know, go and pursue other yeah. other things, which you know I supported. But after that, uh, you know. I always say, like, I'm a very, very small ingredient in in the formula for success. Yeah. I just drive, you know, the thing and do my homework and my due diligence on, you know, testing and make sure make sure everything's uh, working properly. But the, it, it takes a village, you know, to to have a successful program. And there's a lot of people involved in this: uh, powertrain, suspension tuning, you know, motor builder, and you know, prep guys, very, very important. And for them to be obsessive and have a lot of passion and having a platform that they reassembled to do well in a race. And Johnny was very, very good at that. And so I had some staff changes after he left and I had some problems, uh, had some problems with prep, some problems with the chassis flex that was putting stress on transmissions. And I had another marketing partner, I had to be on a, a different tire to help fund the program. And that was like my first major uh, marketing partnership and they were still developing their tire. So I had some trouble, you know, keeping the tires on the thing for a few years. And I had to drive a little bit harder to make up for that. And that, that caused some mechanical difficulties. And I had some su- success on that uh, with that partnership for a while, and then uh, I had a relationship with Toyota Tire, and they make a really, really good tire. First year out, win the thousand, win the thousand again, win championships. Um, but yeah, at, I had you know several years of mayhem where I I didn't have the success that I had in previous years, and that's finally coming back the last five years. Yeah. Um, but it was uh, it's it's always a challenge, you know. It's, it- you know what was that like i mean you know people people don't understand like racing is the highest highs and the lowest lows oh yeah you know we're you know were you at a point where you're like man i'm gonna go do something else i was never i never was at that point you know at the end of the day i always realize like even if you know i i break a ring gear or something like that 100 yards from starting the race and i've had stupid stuff like that happen where I get the green flag to begin an event that's 500 miles and I'm pulled over and done in like five minutes or a couple minutes. And, you know, you can get mad, you know, to a certain extent. Of course, I still did, still get disappointed and angry when, when I have events like that. But the, at the end of the day, you know, I get to drive a million-dollar piece of equipment. Yeah. I get to drive a, a race truck. I am so lucky to be able to do that and have have the intelligence to figure out a way to be successful at that and not, not just in terms of, 
you know, driving, but also maintaining marketing partnerships and, and, uh, being a value as it relates to those relationships. So, well, I, I see a lot of benefit. You know, I, I get to drive this thing. So no matter how far I go, no matter how many championships I win, no matter how many DNFs I, I get, I got to drive a thousand horsepower trophy truck, which is amazing. Well, job. and the the one thing too, like that I saw you do, which I was I was very, I was very proud because I know I had a, a initial seed in setting that up for you oh, was 100%. was that you know you really worked your ass off in building your social media reach, you know. Yeah, I was the first one. Everybody else is uh, was they're still follow. slacking. They're still fu- they're no way slacking. No, it <laughs> yeah. trips me out. Like people yeah. are like, well, how do I get some sponsorship? I look at their social media. I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah, you know, like I've. It's funny because Alex Dryler and I do these summits, and we're going to continue to do them. I want to come to one of those. Yeah, the way. Be, yeah, it'd actually be cool to have you on and have you talk about, you know, what's been successful for you. But like, I can help in that so much, and, yeah, I, and they need help. Yes, they need help. Hundred percent. You know, all, all ships rise. You know, hundred percent. Well, I also ships. think you're in a position, especially with the younger guys. You know, to to play, uh, and I always use the analogy between Dr. Dre and Eminem, right? Like, before Dr. Dre blessed Eminem, he Mm. was nobody. Yeah. But when he said, okay, this white kid is the next big thing, boom, Eminem blows up, right? Yeah. Then years later, when Dr. Dre drops the the chronic, you know, or chronic two, I think it was, right? He needed needed Eminem. Because now Eminem's, you know, the, the big guy. So Eminem leans over and goes, "Yep, this is Dr. Dre's new album," and it it you know that leverage worked beautifully. And you know, I I look at our talent pool, and I'm I'm really excited about it because we've never had this amount of youth in our culture before. We've mm-hmm. never had UTVs before. Like that's ten years now, right? Yeah. And and now you know because of the success of you know, the the Bronco, the um, Raptor, you know, Jeeps, UTVs. Now everybody's looking at this space going, yeah, 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 we'll invest into it, right? Yeah. So now we have a lot of attention on us, um, but there needs to be, you know, higher performance with social media. Like, we work really closely with a third-party group that measures social media called Hook It. And uh, we're working on some stuff with them that I think will help guide everybody. But what was interesting about it is we'd sit down, you know, usually yearly, and we'd measure all of motorsports, right? Mm -hmm. F1 guys, NASCAR guys, everybody, right? And I kept pointing out to him, like, guys, like, you know, cool, uh, top guy in F1, right? Getting paid. $30, $40 Thirty, forty million dollars a year to we, go racing. We need it more than anybody because we don't have eyeballs, right? But even that guy was getting smoked by Ken Block. So, like, yeah. you, you, we would literally measure it and we'd be like, "Okay, this guy was right here with F one, and then all these other racers with all these other disciplines are behind him." And you were, you were in there. You were very, you know, high up in there. And then Ken Block would be way the hell over. The gap was crazy. Yeah, right. And it blew my mind because I'm like, all you have to do is copy Ken Block. Yeah. And you have the funds to do it, mm-hmm. you know? So um, it, it's just interesting. And again, I, I, I give you props because, thanks, brother. you know, I know you invested your own money into doing it. You know, it wasn't, you know, one of your marketing partners didn't just go, hey, we're going to help you out here. Boom, well, we it's work, done. We were working on that together in the, you know, in the, in the very beginning when, uh, when you were doing a, a bunch of stuff for me. Um, and we were working together on producing content. We were... Yeah. You and I were the original guys. You you had it, you know, figured out. And thanks for, you know, giving me credit for for doing that and maintaining that. But uh, I learned a lot from you. You're very very smart as it relates to that aspect. And uh, you well, know, very I, creative. I know. want people. I I appreciate that. But I want people to have success, right? Because mm-hmm. now in the position I'm in now, 
the best case scenario is for me to have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 BJs, right? Yeah. Because that then we're in good shape, right? And yeah, we don't. I can't wait for the sound bite for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take them all. Just yeah. One after It'll another. It'll go right? viral. That would yeah. be great. It's uh, good for everybody. No, we'll, we'll, you know, but the, you know, that's the thing, though, is like, I think it's very important for young racers to understand that, like, the performance you know, in social media is as, if not more important than your performance on the track. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll, I'll pick on, you know, our boy, Rob McCachran. Lo I love him. You know, yeah. he's the goat, right? But because he hasn't invested into his, his social media, he's invisible. Yeah. And it, it's, it's affected his career. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not given him the opportunities that frankly he deserves, right? A hundred percent deserves it. So it, it's, it's a very, very important takeaway, you know, of like, if you, if you want to race and you want to have sponsors, you know, um, you better get on your game, you know, and you better start, you know, and, and you can't really, the other thing is like, we do content for people. But I can't really run their content and their voice, right? Yes. It's got to be authentic. It's got to be authentic. It's got to be from so them. They, they, they don't ever, like, they don't ever think about it. And I hope, I hope all you guys are listening to just this particular point. Okay. We don't have a stadium. We don't have a stadium. We don't drive in a bunch of circles, right, and get dizzy. And we don't have, uh, in certain circumstances, we don't have coverage, you know, from different areas from television. But... So as it relates to people getting to see your truck and, 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 and getting to see your partners and who you work with, you can't put that person in Baja. Right. That's 14 hours away. These people got jobs. They can't take time off for certain things. Like right. Your ideal customer is fifth row. I want the single mother of four in Delaware that's never even heard of desert racing to know who I am and become aware of desert racing because she saw something that one of her friends shared. Yeah. You know, you can't put that person on the racetrack in Baja. Right. But you can put them in your pocket. Yeah. You can put yourself in their pocket. 100%. If you're producing, you know, engaging, engaging content. And I've always worked really, really, really hard on that. Not just for myself and the success of my program, but for the success of the entire sport. Because I am so passionately in love with this dynamic of racing because it's so much different than any other form of race. Right. It's the only race car that doesn't accelerate well, change direction, or stop very well. Right. And it's fascinating because it doesn't have to slow down for anything. Yeah. It's crazy. You yeah, know? I mean, it, our form of racing, I, you know, I'm biased, obviously, as you are, is the most dynamic form of racing 100%. in the world, right? Yeah. And we, the challenge going forward is eyeballs, right? So we are tiny in the world of motorsports. Motorsports is tiny in the world of traditional sports. Like I, I was, Messi just did his deal, right? And and he's gonna like they're projecting what his impact will who, be. Who is that? Lionel Messi, the soccer oh, player. Oh, okay, yeah. So he he just went. They traded him, or I'm sorry, he went. To Miami, to them. I love that you study this shit, it's right? I, I breathe. I live and breathe. So this is a, this is a literally it's the craziest uh, sports deal really in history, right? Uh -huh. So he left the European Soccer League, where that's where all the money's at. People are like, "Oh, we'll give you thirty million. We'll give you forty million, right?" So David Beckham is here, right? So Beckham engineers this deal where it's not just money; it's it's shares, it's future earnings it's all these things you know where now he's he's gonna be wealthy beyond his dreams indefinitely mm -hmm. so it's not just about the money he gets over the next five years of his career but his shirt numbers alone like they're projecting like between 180 million and 360 million dollars in wow. merchandise sales just because one player right who by the way is 30% of the entire European League's uh, social media reach, Yeah, right, is, is going to go to Miami, right? It's like when and you... And he follows, he follows the same program that you advised to me 15 years ago. Yeah, 100%. And you had a different way of saying it because we were having some drinks at the time, but <laughs> <laughs> you want to be the guy that yeah. every guy wants to be and the guy that every girl wants to be with. You yeah. know, you want to you wanna have be high-performing, and, you know, be attractive in a wide variety of areas in terms of skill set and, you know, taking care of yourself and your team and, and, and well, all that. People love 
we're, we're designed, we're programmed from an early age to love champions, right? Yes. And it doesn't matter whether that's in business or golf or we worship them. And especially in this country. I mean, you, you look at Trump and like, why are people so enamored with Trump? Because he's a winner. Yeah. And he walks out and makes sure that you know that he's a winner. Yeah. Right. So, you know, that's, it's that cult of personality. He, he won the presidency off of know, what we're dude. talking about he right totally now. <laughs> he won the presidency on Twitter. You yeah. know what I mean? It's crazy. So, you know, it, it it's a really important, it's a really important thing. And, you know, I am, again, I'm excited about the future because a lot of these kids that, that are, have started racing now, they were born with this in their hand. Yeah. And they understand it on how important it is and they're comfortable with it, which I think is great because a lot of the, you know, a lot of the older guys, I was like, you know, I was arguing and teasing Sal about it. I'm like, Sal, we need to make an Instagram account. And he's like, ah, I don't, you know, and I'm like, you don't understand. People are tagging you anyways. And it's yeah. some Mexican guy in Tijuana that made the account. Right. And I showed him that and he's like, we got to stop that. Yeah. I'm like the way you stop it is by creating an account. You can literally put your brand in your customer's pocket. You know, so like, I, I think that's hard. I think that's hard for, you know, most old school competitors to realize it is very, very simple, very simple. And then, you know, common sense isn't so common, but you can literally put your brand in someone's pocket in your customer's pocket. And I think that was very, very hard for people to understand. And I, I was uh, the first person in the sport to, to do that. And I, I was an orphan out there. I was an orphan out there for like, what, like five or six years. We were the only yeah. ones putting stuff out in, in, in our sport. And, you know, we, we modeled some of that after what you were doing with, with Ken, which was very, very intelligent is putting your brain in somebody's pocket, you yeah. know? Yeah. I mean, the, you know, the evolution of Jim Connor, you know, I talk about it quite a bit lately, especially with, you know, the passing of Ken. Yeah. And, you know, what we, you know, I want, I want people to understand, like, we didn't, you know, we did this to, to create attention for rally. Yes. You know, we were racing rally and we were like, look, we're spending, you know, millions of dollars and nobody cares. Mm -hmm. How do we get them to give a shit? Well, let's make a <clears throat> let's make a skateboard film with a car. Yeah. It's literally the nucleus of it was that simple. And I remember uh, YouTube had just started and everybody was sketched out on it. They're like, oh, "Wait, you put your content on there and they own it? I don't understand. Like, how does this work?" So we didn't put it on YouTube initially. We, we had it on a server and it was like Windows really? Media. Yeah, and luckily the guy who owned that business was my friend. And so he calls me and he said, "Hey, I'm going to save you about a hundred grand because the the you know the views of this thing is going bonkers." He's like, "Take it off. We're going to shut it down, right? Because it's over. It was like overloading as servers, right? And you need to put it on YouTube." I'm like, "Oh shit, you know." And I go talk to my brother. And I'm like, "Hey, here's the situation." And they're like, "Tell Ken, like, hey, we want to do it this way. Otherwise, how many views was it getting on that particular? It, it had already." It, it was already millions of views, right? Okay. I mean, it, 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 had, it had caught on pretty quick. So it was burning their system down a little it, bit. Like, literally, you know, th it was shutting down their server, right? <laughs> and, again, luckily, this guy was friends <laughs> with me, and he's called me and said, hey, you know, I don't want to play this game and just surprise you with, like, here's a $100,000 bill for video serving, Right. I'm like, okay, cool. Like that's, you know, because <laughs> I, I didn't have that money. We we took every penny we had and put it into producing the first Jim Connor, and uh, you know, so I tell Ken like, hey, we gotta, this is what we gotta do, and he's like, okay, you know, and we were very skeptical of it, you know, and I remember you coming over and <clears throat> showing me at the shop. Yeah, You're like you got to check this out. I think that was, was it before you put it on YouTube? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You showed it to me, and yeah. that's a very special moment for me. And thank you for sharing that because I, I got to see that before well, everybody else did. I, you know, like once I understood after we we were doing the edits, and so like editing is an interesting thing because it's like I always use stupid analogies. It's like you're cooking something, and when you're cooking something, you're tasting it, and you're like, oh man, I got something here, right? Yeah. And so my brother and I were were, you know, and my brother was editing it, and I'm, you know. Uh, directing or you know arguing with him about edits right and 
we we have a we have great opposite minds, right? Uh-huh. So he sees things I don't see, and I see things he doesn't see, right? And I'm very like, hey, <clears throat> this has got to be punk rock. It's got to be visceral. It's got to be like a skateboard film. And one of the things of, that we learned from filming skateboarding was like, if you shoot from a distance, it kills the 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 energy. Yeah. But if you're up in uh, now, skateboarding's famous for you know we, the death lens, right? The the big fisheye lens that you're like right up. Oh on, yeah, right? the death lens. <clears throat> and we use that technique. You know, mm-hmm. there there's multiple shots in in that first um, in that in the first Gymkhana where we're like, Ken did it, and we're like, we need to be three feet close closer to you, and he's like, well, I'm not comfortable with that. Yeah, I'm that like, was before he he had a, that level of control. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he was still. I mean, dude, like he was, he was a rookie when you, when you filmed, like that's not pretty, like doing this video with somebody that's a season, even a season athlete. Like, you know, I, I, I love, uh, I, I'm not going to mention his name, but, uh, I love a guy in our sport. You probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Dude. Very, very good driver. Yeah. Um, but you put a camera on him and it's like, Ooh, like, you yeah, know, I, I can't do certain things that I can usually do. And he's a very, very good driver, very yeah. competitive guy. So now you take um, that dynamic of now I'm going to stuff this camera in your face. Oh, yeah. it, obviously, it's 60 yards away, but it feels like it's right there. Yeah. So you're, you're having to, to do 100% of your ability in managing you know, the car control and making sure the thing doesn't flip upside down and be on fire. You don't want to get that on film. I, <laughs> uh, <we've, laughs> I just came from a terror crew event that I was not very happy about. <laughs> I, I saw it. <laughs> yeah. I was going to I was gonna text you. I'm like, everybody's texting. I'm going to leave them alone. Right? <laughs> the memes were great that came yeah. out of that. It was the first time I did something like that in 20 years. So I was like, all right, I was overdue for it. Yeah. But you know, it's, it's one thing. Back to Ken, he's a rookie at that time. And yeah. he and he was pretty good considering the circumstances. It was great. And then you stuff a camera in his face. So he had uh it, as it relates to, to first Jim Con that you filmed with him, that had to be extremely challenging for, for him to do properly. And you got some incredible was, shots out there that inspired dude, me immediately. It, you're 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 taking uh to put it very simply, you're taking a, a vehicle. And showing somebody that has a vehicle that might look like it or might not, yeah. that this vehicle is extremely special and this vehicle cannot yeah. do that. That's why that's why rally racing is so fascinating, is yeah. because and that wasn't even that was like a pre runner, yeah. right? It wasn't even a real race car. I went no. and saw that at his at his services. It didn't have a Cajun <laughs> or anything. Didn't have Cajun. <laughs> so the, these are the details, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, these are these are the details. They're they're hilarious because it's like you know, so the car builder who built that for us was Court Crawford, right? He's an engine builder predominantly, and I don't think he understood what we were doing. He mm-hmm. just knew, like, hey, Matt said it needs to have all this horsepower. I'm going to build this super engine, and it's, you know, essentially a ticking time bomb. What did it make? I think, like, 600 and, 600 and something horsepower. Is that tall on the ground? or Yeah. Wow. Yeah, Court was is a very good. So it had a big hair dryer on it. <laughs> yeah, a very good builder, and, and that those engines in particular, you know, grown up building sand cars, and that engine is very special, right? Mm-hmm. You can do a lot of things that most engines can't. They would just blow to pieces, right? Yeah. So we had that part. We you know, were like, okay, cool. But then a lot of everything else was theory, right? It was like the opening shot I'll never forget because I thought the car was going to be caged. Yeah, that's that's what you told me. The op- <clears throat> you're like, you got to see this. You never believe this. Yeah. I he told me he was going to do this, and you're like, dude, you're going to roll over 15 million times and die. Like you, well, gonna, you know, there was, you know, f- the first thing is I, I we get there and you know we're surveying you know El Toro airfield and there's like six inch lips everywhere right the asphalt's all broken yeah. from stuff that's grown underneath it yeah it just yeah. shifted right and i'm like okay that's bad right so i, <laughs> yeah, I like for that platform yeah it's not like us where that's like not a big deal right but for you know it was, and the car was lowered a lot lower than i thought it was going to be so there were a lot of details where that that was one of the impetuses for why now when we do anything i am like look i'm building the car i'm in control of everything because i'm not going to kill anybody yeah that's the last thing i'm going to do but now i'm like what wheels now i'm like super detailed on 
you know, car builds having extra cars because we're going to smash this car. Yeah. And you have 50 guys standing around at 100 grand a day at least. Yeah. And so what are you going to do now? Pull the other car out, right? Yeah. And and start fixing this one. And hopefully when we wreck this one, and that that's what we learned. That's cost me in a lot of production. Cost me on like almost every well, single you, recoil. And you were, doing, you were doing it with your race truck, yeah, right? Yeah. You're like, well... <laughs> We're done racing it, so in between these races, we can shoot some stuff, then reprep it really quick and yeah. go win a race. Like that's crazy. Yeah, and it's crazy too that that the sponsors are like, "Oh yeah, you should do that." You're like, "That's a terrible idea," you yeah. know. <laughs> but you know, they I'm, don't understand. All right, Chase, number twenty three. It's twenty twenty three. This championship's yours. Let's show these guys what's up. Easy, boys. It's not over yet. Big dog still gotta eat. Whatever you say, big dog. Seriously? These fools think I'm fried? They know the deal. I look in the car and it's just got one bar going across the back of the car, and I'm like, okay, it's not caged. <laughs> Shit. Between the B pillars yeah. and that's it. Right? And then I'm like, I'm like, I, f we, we, you know, we flagged like where the lips were, you know, and then we realized it's like a minefield. It's like, <laughs> if you don't hit your mark, you, you, when you slide <laughs> sideways at a hundred miles an hour, which by the way, it was all theory, right? What was interest speed on that? He was just north of a hundred miles an hour when he flipped that car sideways. Yeah. Right? Cause after it, after it goes like over 120, that's when the, it comes off the ground. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it, you know, we didn't know what it was going to do, right? And, you know, it, that's where the dynamic between the trust between Ken and I and, and vice versa, us with Ken, you know, like came into play. And, you know, we did it. It worked. You know, it, it took a couple takes. But, you know, Ken, to give him a lot of credit, like he jumped off the cliff. You know what I mean? Yeah. He was like, okay, right? So, you know, we we did it and you know, it was great. And then same thing with the with the shot of, of him doing donuts around my brother on the Segway, like that was all theory. And we're standing there and like all the guys that worked for me at the time were like, All right, you get on the Segway and everybody's like, Uh uh, no, no. Right. And Josh is like, well, you guys are pussies. Right. And he gets yeah. up there and well, he understands that, that the car is only going about four and a half miles an hour. Kind of. Right? And it wants to go out. Not now. In. Now we understand that. Yeah. Right. But, you know, he ended up on the hood and on the ground a couple times. Oh, he did. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, where yeah. are the outtakes for that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was, and it was funny because when that film came out and it really started getting notoriety i was i was worried because i knew my mom was gonna see it <laughs> <laughs> and i knew she was gonna be pissed off that i let my brother do this right and she and it was funny years later she's like why did you let your brother do that he could have died and i'm like no actually maybe he could have gotten maimed but like she, she was pretty pissed but no it's it's funny and I, i'm glad you know somebody you know and, and especially i'm glad that it's you Put the effort in for social media because, like, I love it when I go around and I'm talking to somebody and they're, they're like, like BJ Baldwin. I'm like, yes, exactly like BJ yeah. Baldwin, right? That's what we do. So I think it's I think it's important. And I want to help people do that more and more. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of things that we haven't even accomplished with with videos with with you know with vehicles. You know, uh, one of the one of the cooler clips that I saw where somebody was like taking advantage of that and had some creativity was uh I, I can't think of the name right now the all carbon fiber uh herbs truck it's the the people oh are, people's racing people's yeah. racing yeah, yeah. they, through they the had the truck fields. through the weed field yeah, i thought and that was great. by weed we mean marijuana yeah it's, <laughs> yeah it's it's legal now you know yeah that was a really cool clip and that didn't take very much no you know i no. don't know how much that cost well, that's their weed field, so I, yeah. I think they're good, right? Yeah. No, the, the the people's racing guys, Bernard and and his whole Chris, and they're all they're cool. They're I, and I love that's the other thing I love. I love when people step out of like what everybody else is doing. They're yeah. Like, nope, we're gonna do all carbon fiber. You know, we're gonna do our logo on it, and then we're gonna do all this content. It was funny they told me about it. I was just laughing. I'm like, 
the only better thing they could have done was like have Cheech and Chong driving it. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. And that's the type of stuff that'll that'll go viral and and people will see it. And like, it was funny because I'm supposed to actually have lunch with these guys in the next week, but um, they were playing it in their stores. So imagine you're going to some some weed shop and you're like, da, 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 give me this, give me. Th- what the hell, right? Yeah. To me, yeah. that's a victory. Yeah, that's for sure a victory. Like, you, you got to take a look at this. You know, they're bringing their friends over that are, that are shopping there, and they're getting exposure with that. That's That was a really cool clip to to see. Um, but, yeah, we got we to gotta put ourselves in people's pockets, yeah. you know, as, as a community, because we are at a tactical disadvantage as it relates to the exposure that you can't just go kidnap, you know, a few million people and, and put them in the middle of the desert so that they can see how special this is. And even if they did that, and you and I both know this, nobody knows how amazing that thing is until they have stepped out of the passenger seat. Sure. Is most, I, I've taken dozens and dozens, of, well, sh- hundreds of people for rides yeah. in the trophy truck uh, in test sessions. And what's really unique about that, like you see people go for rides in drift cars and uh, they're they're terrified. Yeah, they're like it's very very exciting for them. That does not last for very long when you go for a ride in a trophy truck. Right, you go way past that. You know, yeah, you, you go from they're they're only terrified. They're really nervous when they get in, and then by the time I I'm going about fifty miles an hour in an area where I can go about a hundred and fifteen miles an hour. Right, they're past fear. They're confused. They don't understand you, you how that's to, happening. No, you have to give up. I was explaining to somebody like my first time in a trophy truck with a good driver, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I had a pretty good. Who, under- who, who was it? Uh, the first one. I'm trying to think, you know, um, cause you went my truck early, but you, you had been w- with somebody else. before. One of the, one of the more memorable r- ones was Robbie Gordon trying to torture me. Yeah. Right. There, there's been a he's lot. He's good with that. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's looking at you. <laughs> yeah. Like, are you scared yet? Right. <laughs> no, that one was re- really memor- me- memorable because we we're, we we're training Andy at the time. Right. And so Andy gets in the truck. We're in San Felipe. Oh, and yeah. Andy's going really good right away. I was like, this is awesome, right? Yeah. I'm like, you're doing great, man. If you don't have somebody to hold your hand through through that for the introduction into the dynamics of difference between trucks and class ones, well, it takes years. And especially that truck. It's a mid-engine truck. It's diff- yeah. It doesn't start working until you're doing 80. You yeah, know, then it you have to be committed. It kind of comes together when you're when you're uh, higher speed. Otherwise, it's a handful yeah. everywhere. You're just hustling. I've driven that truck. That, yeah, so that you, thing's yeah. awesome. Yeah, but you have to be committed. You have to have the butterflies open and hit stuff with extreme confidence in order for it to work properly. So I can imagine it's not like driving a, like a regular trophy truck, uh, like you a know, geyser. That, you can, yeah, you, you know, you're cruising. You're like, All you right, can go between woo. like sixty and a hundred percent fairly easily. Yeah. But with Robbie, the way he has uh, his stuff, his stuff set up, which I always loved. He's an extremely smart guy. He's a legend of the sport. And uh, I was, definitely. I was inspired. And I learned a lot from him too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he taught me a lot and took me under his wing. I always call him like uh, the big brother that, you know, I love, but sometimes, I want to get in a fight with, <laughs> you know. Um, Same. But I, I have almost gone, gotten in fights yeah, a little bit. But no, he's, he's, he's well. In, uh, but I also I love his spirit. I appreciate oh, his 100%. spirit. Right? He's got the passion and the obsession he, too. He definitely he's represents the middle finger, right? Gifted. Yeah. You know, and and unfortunately now I'm I'm the promoter, so I'm receiving the middle finger from him. <laughs> yeah. right? It's all good, but no. So you know, and he's driving. He's doing great, right? And at that point, I'm like, you're good, dude. That's all you need to do today. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, get get a feel for it, whatever. And Robbie goes, okay, uh, I'm getting in, right? And I'm like, cool. He did that with me, too. Yeah. So I start unbuckling. I'm in the passenger seat. I start unbuckling. He goes, he didn't really even know me at this time. He goes, you stay in, right? Because I, I think he heard me praising Andy, a little bit too much, right? And he's yeah. jealous, he's a little jealous. He's jealous, and he, I think he was also like, Hey, dude, shut the fuck up. Yeah, you don't praise him. I'm the only one who can praise him. Who are you, right? Oh, yeah. So it's, it was kind of like a training method that you were interrupting with a little bit, not not intentionally, but yeah, yeah, I think so, right? Mm-hmm. So then, because there was really kind of no reason for me to stay in the truck at that point, other than the fact that he really wanted to show me 
the the levels, yeah. right? And he he was like, okay, that was some white belt shit. Yeah, I'm gonna show you the black belt shit, and he yeah. did. And I, I can tell you, like driving through the whoops with him in that truck, and then cornering. Um, that was the thing that just blew my mind. That's where that, the honey's at. It's yeah. like when he was cornering in whoops, right? And I'm I'm looking at the ground, going, "We're crashing," going like this yeah. as you're going past. Yeah, I'm it. like, "We're crashing," and then I was like, "I don't understand why we're not crashing." And to your point of like when you when you have an experience like that, you're just you can't do anything. You're just absorbing it, and you're you're like, okay. And then literally, you know, he's afterwards, he's like, or he's looking at me and I'm like, yes, I'm terrified. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like what? Yeah. Especially with that motor on the chip, 9,000 RPM. Make the ride stop because at that point, I don't know where the limit's at. Yeah. You know, like we've already gone blown past what I thought the limit was at. He, He knows, you don't know that he's not showing off and only he knows that he doesn't have to. Right. Like, that's why I tell people that ride with me. Like, you know, they're like, Oh, you know, don't show off. I'm like, dude, I do not have to show off. Right. You know, you were, you're going to have your mind blown. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. So, so I get out, I get out of the car and he's like, what do you think? And I'm like, I'm excited. It's like mind blowing, whatever. Right. It takes a minute to process. I had to like, I literally sat down and I'm like, I had to think almost like meditate about it. And I remember Scott McMillan laughing, you know, and he's like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. I just need to think about this for a minute. And he's just laughing his ass off, right? Because I, I had ridden with Scott, you know, a, a bit in his class one car and he's a, he's a phenomenal driver, yeah. but Robbie is just like, he knows, he, he, like you were talking about earlier, it's like, he knows where the limits are. He also knows like, you know, the, the, the you know, the nine lives cat stuff. Like I can push it here. Yeah. I won't die. Yeah. No, no he's going to die, but it's going to be a bad crash. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if, if it goes wrong. Right. And so like, to me, I'm like, we're just testing. We're teaching Andy. We're it's the first like day in the trophy truck in this particular trophy truck. And, and he's trying to accelerate the learning process as fast as possible. Did, and I also think he was trying to show me and everybody like, Hold, hold my beer, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm Robbie Gordon. I'm going to show you, you know, what this vehicle is capable of with a driver at my level. And, and honestly, I was blown away, yeah. you know, and, uh, um, you know, that was one, you know, there's been a lot, a lot of the, like, I really enjoy riding with you because uh, it was, you know, we went through this learning process together. Mm-hmm. And so even for me, I learned a lot like, okay, the vehicle's capable of this, not capable of that. Uh, here are the, you know, pros of this vehicle, you know, in, in the SPD truck versus these other trucks. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, so yeah, it's, and then I also enjoy how special it is. You know, I, I use this analogy a lot, right? More people have gone to outer space than ridden in a trophy truck. Yeah. There's less than a hundred of them have ever been made. Yeah. So when you extrapolate out that number of people who've ridden, a couple thousand maybe in total, driven, ridden, it's a very special thing, you know. And like you said, the dynamics of it are just it, – it's opposite of what every – anything you know about a car goes out the window. Out the window. You know, and you're just like, well, I'm not sure what just happened. I got to process it, <laughs> right? So it's really cool. And I'm – and I'm you know, it's one of the other things is like – giving rides and getting people engaged, you know, I think that's very important for our culture, you know? Yeah. I'm doing a, I did a ride along contest with one of my, uh, marketing partners first form. Yeah, I saw that. Great. That's cool. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, that's, I think it's in two or three weeks, but it, yeah, back to your point of like, it's very, very difficult. It's, it's almost impossible to describe Like my best way of describing it is like, uh, you know, a Ford Raptor. Everybody has a buddy that's got a Ford Raptor. Right. They've gone off road and they're like, wow, this thing's really impressive. Like a part of my test section that's specifically dedicated towards suspension, uh, development, right. you know, and, and tuning and stuff like that. It's a mile long, you know, the test section, yeah. you've been there before a bunch of times, but it's like a, a Ford Raptor R can go through that area at about 26, maybe 28 miles an hour. Right without exploding right and a trophy truck my trophy truck goes through there at 116 miles an hour so it's not like it's like way faster than something that you can buy off the showroom yeah. floor that's dedicated to like off-road performance 
e- even if it, it it's like three times as fast, it's yeah. unimaginably faster than anything that you could have access to, you know, in, in reality. The trophy trucks, that's what makes it so special. Like, I think, you know, I've never been in a Formula One car. I've, I've driven a stock car. Um, and was it impressive? Yeah, but the, the volume of being impressed was not nearly as much as uh, my first time in a trophy truck and what I've seen other people experience. The volume's cranked all the way up, and the knob is broken off. Right, you know that it's it's insanely different than anything you can even begin to imagine as it relates to how well they ride and how fast they can go through stuff. It's absolutely ridiculous, you know. Yeah. So no, absolutely. I love taking people for rides. It's so much fun. I, I, I know, and I love it. I mean, I I love that as well because I, again, I think it's super important in converting people to you know, enthusiasts of, of, of what we're doing, you know, so keep doing it. Yeah. So, you know, you're, you're at this point where like, you know, and two, like this, this guy shows up in your program and it was really funny. Cause I'm like, everybody starts talking about this Cal craft guy. I'm like, I had to go like, look him up. I'm like, is this guy like some, did he come from NASCAR? Like, why is everybody Cal craft, Cal craft? Like, you know, he's become part of your program and has that helped you quite a bit? Seems like a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Um, because I was there, you know, I was there during the birth of that individual's relates to his intelligence in, uh, in, in racing. He, he is, he's been very successful in, uh, racing, uh, before me and in, in, in his 6,100 trucks. So my hat's off to him for that. But what made him really, really special is in some way, shape, or form, he had a pen and paper. You know, he, I, I had a, a meeting about, it was an interview about being a navigator for me and the possibility of, of making that happen. And I'll never forget, I was, uh, I took the meeting at a DMV when I was taking uh, my stepsister to get her driver's license, you know, and she was in there doing the tests and the paperwork. And I, I, said, I said, I'm sorry, this, you know, this is what I got available. It was kind of a test too, to see um, how dedicated he was. Sure. And it was my first time, it's my first time meeting him. And, you know, I said, this is what I need. Let's, you know, let's go testing and s- see if that works out. He, he seemed to be very, very dedicated and he, he was down for whatever. So uh, it wasn't it, finding a navigator that's on point is extremely difficult. I've sure. gone through a bunch of them. You know, I, it's hard. There's yeah. only a few. I've, I, I had, you know, uh, a guy make a mistake and I'm not going to call him out, you know, because I, I wish him the best. But it was very, very well known in the industry that was riding with me at the Baja 1000 and missed a note. And I hit a rock the size of a school bus at 85 miles an hour, which, yep. you know, we, we, we can't have that stuff. And you, you keep trying to get certain navigators to evolve, and certain people can only go so far. Um, you really need a killer in, in that seat that's like, yo, we're, we're going to you know, try and, and get this trophy. To your point. The cost us our life. We're good. Exactly. You, you know? know, to your point, it's, you know, it's so important because you're driving at, a, at, a, at such a high level that it could be life or death. Yeah, exactly. You, know, and you have to take that mindset of like, you know, this is not a game. Yeah, exactly. This, this race could in an end, you know, three weeks from now in the hospital, you know, so you, you have to, you definitely have to back to mindset. You have to have that mindset. And Kyle has, has always had that. And I, you know, as it relates to how I like to be communicated with in the race car, I, I didn't let alone, having to tell somebody 35 times, I didn't have to tell him more than once. Right. And whenever, you know, he's made a mistake in the beginning, which was even in the beginning, was very, very rare. Um, you know, a couple of times he was, uh, you know, apologizing for missing, you know, a note or something like that in the beginning. And I said, that's in the past. That's a quarter mile ago. You know, right. we're into the future. I need to know what's going on, in, you know, in a quarter mile. And know that, if you ever make a mistake, you're immediately forgiven. Just focus on the, focus on the task at hand right. of, you know, giving me some input on what the future holds. The immediate yeah. future is, you know, three seconds from now. Right. And obviously we have pre-running. We, we remember a bunch of different sections, but you have it in more cognitive detail for you to process so that your inputs are at the maximum velocity that you take X, Y, Z at 
then, then that'll help you manufacture more, more speed so you can be more competitive and more dominating. And Kyle's been great from, uh, from a navigating perspective, but in terms of, in terms of uh, business and, and helping me run the partnerships, he's been uh, you know, the keystone in, in helping me do that in the last you know, four years. He's been outstanding. He's, he's the, you know, I've had some good navigators, but Kyle by far is the best navigator that, that I've ever had. And on top of that, he's, he's not just somebody that, uh, that I work with in that aspect. Like, like it's been, you know, in certain relationships that I've had with certain navigators, you know, some of them have been, uh, friends and some of them have just been, you know, there for business. And Kyle's like, more than a friend he's like a brother to me you know he's he's ready to die for the program and he wants the best for the program and he takes ownership for the trials or the triumphs and challenges that we've had so you know when we uh have something some kind of mistake in the program he takes ownership and he's uh he gets it sorted out you know stuff that's not have anything to do with him he takes responsibility of it and tries to figure it out and the stuff that does you know the victories that we have had he takes ownership of of that as well makes him very very special and very very important to the program and uh i would not have the successful uh program that i've had in the last four years without him he's he's a a key ingredient so i'm very appreciative for that do you do you think that comes from him being a driver I think it helps. Um, I think it definitely helps from him being a driver, and he's he's gotten a lot better since he's ridden with me because you know he can he can kind of absorb the information that he's getting from being in the car, but also from you know me talking to him about how I do certain things. Um, it's it's definitely helped his driving. And his navigating has helped my driving, so it's 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 a good trade off. But he's uh, he's been fantastic, and I look forward to a long future with him. He's he's been a key to a key ingredient to the formula for success. Well, I mean, I'm honestly like you know we've been friends for a long time. I'm I'm really excited for you for your future of your program, and you know uh, there, there's a lot to be done. Yet, yeah, you know what I mean. Um, so. You know, on that note, man, thank you for doing this. And yeah, hundred percent. Thank I, you, you know, for having me. I, I think we only really scratched the surface. Yeah, but we could do this again. Yeah, we, could we do, should. We got a lot of good stories about being on fire and crashing <laughs> yes. and all this, you know, this stuff. Yeah. But uh, you know, thanks for letting me. Uh, thanks for letting me come on here and talk about my program. I really appreciate it, and I'm, I'm very, very proud of you for what you've done in the, in the sport, and I'm very excited about this podcast and. Helping it grow and helping the, I the whole that. sport grow. Well, so. we're all in it. Hell yeah. You know, this thing grows. It's good for everybody. Yeah, all ships rise. That's right. Exactly. Thanks, brother. Thanks, brother. I appreciate right. it.